Oh, <laughs> hey, Momo. Ah! <sighs> See, with that, I now understand that you, as a character, like your element lightning, are volatile but powerful, with your anger prone to get out of control. This has been a lesson in elemental magic. Good evening everyone, it is 2021, welcome to the channel, a place of refuge and certainty in these hard times. Because unlike other places in the world, here on Hello Future Me, we have a stable political system not prone to coups and our supreme empress Momo. All hail Momo. Elemental magic systems are like your average office water cooler. They're cool, and they've got water. I know it was a bad joke, don't get fired up about it. And I know why you would want to write one. When I was 13, I wrote this fantasy book. Which will never see the light of day. About these four kids who could all control one element and they were called guardians and the main guy controlled air and they could go into this rage mode called status. As you can tell, originality was my strong suit. But let's talk about how you might do one well nowadays. Oh, and do you like reading? And do you have ears? Well, now you can read my book on writing and world building with your ears. It's an audiobook, Number one bestseller on this channel's bestseller list. Uh, it's already sold 23,000 copies and everyone knows that books that sell well must be good. Uh, it's also read by some really cool people, Larissa and Murph, you might know them. It's got like all of the on writing and world building chapters in an easy to read and reference book. So, you know, links down below and not just on Amazon, it's on a bunch of different places that aren't owned by Amazon if you don't want to give them any of them because people wanted that. Cool, links down below. I don't mean to be a downer, but uh... Elemental magic systems aren't that original. But come on, we are used to the common four or five elements all over the place. So, here are two ways to be more original with an elemental magic system. One, it's not the elements, but how you use them narratively that matters. The great thing about elemental magic is that we already have these cultural associations with each element. Fire and anger, water and healing, life and energy. This makes it really easy to code characters and things in your world with ideas and personality traits. The character Aravos in The Dragon Prince is aligned with the stars, and the writers use how we project a sense of wonder, awe, power, mystery that we find in the night sky to inspire these same feelings in this equally mysterious character. Zuko's firebending is an analogue for his hot-headedness and struggles with anger throughout the series, while Katara's motherly and healing character is expressed through her waterbending. By using these natural assumptions that we as readers all have, elemental magic creates a more visceral and visual way of expressing exploring and manifesting these character traits. Magic can become an analog for character growth, struggles, attributes, right from the beginning of your story, and you can more easily pull readers into caring about your characters because of it. We don't have this natural connection with, say, the power of the witches in the Northern Lights to separate from their daemon. We don't really know what this means for who they are, what they believe, what their personalities are like. So understanding who they are because of it takes Philip Pullman a lot more time to explain in the story. And it's not just about characters, but dynamics between your characters. Common tropes connected to elemental magic are the five-man band and the power trio. You'll know them, you've seen them in a ton of stories, I promise. These are common character setups. You've got the leader, the lancer, the smart guy, the big guy, and the heart of the group. They all fill a specific emotional or narrative role and can do things that nobody else in the group really can. Elemental magic, for obvious reasons, fits in pretty well with this. By dividing the elements between characters, you give everyone a unique role, and you can tie in how the characters relate to one another to how their elements relate to one another. The smart guy might let his intellect get in the way of him being empathetic and kind, while the heart might let her emotions get in the way of her being smart. The show Witch does exactly this, with Irma being the big guy and having her controlling the earth element, while Hei Lin is the heart of the group and she controls air. These are two opposite people within the group and they have two opposite elements. In contrast, the power trio might have two characters who are diametrically opposed. They typically disagree and so they have fire and water, and then one person caught in between them. Again, you can use these associations to create a magical metaphor of sorts for character relationships. 
giving them a new way to express it and a new way for you to visualize it in your story. But this is also a weakness. A lot of the reason that elemental magic feels so samey and unoriginal a lot of the time is that authors are using these common associations to do the same character arcs and character dynamics that we have seen a million times before. Oh? The fire user's arc is about controlling his anger? Wow, would have never thought of that! The earth wizard's arc is about them being more flexible? Well, eat my cat and call me Wally, I've never heard that one before. Part of being original here is not only finding new associations for the elements, but also finding different roles for the magic to play narratively. This is why Jack Frost in Rise of the Guardians is pretty damn cool, I love that film. He completely breaks their association of ice being slow, grim, connected to darkness or even death, and he makes it about being fun and rebirth and living in the moment. It's a fundamental part of his character arc to find his place in the world, but it's not an arc that we've seen really associated with ice magic before. Jim Butcher's Codex Alera series associates Earth with lust and being in the moment. It's an uncommon association, but it's one I can totally get behind, because it's about being grounded. It's about your desires and needs in the real physical world. As for the different narrative roles it can play in your story, it doesn't need to be used as an analogue for your character arcs or traits. It can be used to explore the world, the tone, the themes. Narnia's world being overtaken by a magical icy winter tells us immediately that this world is unforgiving and grim when it could be so much more because of our cultural emphasis on the coming of spring, even though winter is better and you will damn well know it. But it also creates a tonal childish wonder through Lucy's eyes. In Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series, the magic system is used to explore the industrial revolution that the world is undergoing. In the unsurprisingly named A Song of Ice and Fire series by George R. R. Martin, fire and ice magic are intensely related to the themes he wants to explore. Beric Dondarrion's repeated fire magic resurrection helps explore how death is the ultimate equalizer, and that the ability to die is part of what makes us more human. The mysterious winter ice magic of the North is more about creating an eerie atmosphere and somber tone to his writing. Robert Jordan's The Wheel of Time uses the divide between the masculine fire and earth magics and female water and air magics to explore gender relations. See, I find stories with elemental magic systems to be pretty tonally neutral. They're not inherently whimsical or grimdark. They're the rainbow technicolor dream goat of aesthetics. Consider adding elements that change the tone or inform what you want. Maybe earth magic kills plants around you, making it more of a grim dark world full of sacrificial magic. Or perhaps the fire is controlled through upbeat saxophone music, making the world full of whimsical wizards who did it with a saxophone. Yeah baby, you thought the meme was gone, but it is back! But what I'm trying to get at here is I want you to think about what you want your elemental magic to do in your story narratively. What does it inform thematically, tonally, and worldly? Yeah, sure, how does it affect who your characters are and how you represent them? Yeah, but maybe think about doing things that haven't been done so much before. The second way to make them more original is pretty simple. The elements themselves. In Aaron Haas's The Dragon Prince, the elements aren't based around the classical four or five, but around the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the sky, and the ocean. It's familiar, and still results in lightning being thrown around, but the aesthetic and framing is fundamentally different to how we would usually imagine it. There are also expressions of these powers that we haven't seen before. The moon leads to invisibility, and the sun, which is comparable to fire, can manifest in healing abilities that burn away sickness. Sanderson's Mistborn series is an even weirder and more brilliant example of elemental magic. It uses real elements. I mean like iron and zinc and tin. It's based around metals on the periodic table. Using tin can sharpen your senses. Iron allows you to pull on metals that are nearby. It is an elemental magic system, sure, but again, its design and how it's used in the story does not feel familiar in the slightest. I tend to find that new and interesting elemental setups all have one thing in common. An inventive, unifying theme. Like the Dragon Prince and Mistborn, things aren't just different for the sake of it. I once read a story by a friend of mine where they chose kinetic, shadow, sound, and light as their four elements. It was distracting how obviously they were just trying to be different from the original four or five. There was no uniting theme to those powers, and they didn't add enough to the world or characters to be worth the awkwardness. I mean, readers notice this kind of stuff. 
If you're just trying to be different, don't call it wind, energy, nature, and ice. Don't just be different for the sake of being different, be different and be clever. And unifying themes really help with that. Now, it wouldn't be a magic systems video without referencing Sanderson's three laws. Your ability to solve problems with magic is proportional to how well the reader understands said magic, limitations are more important than powers, and go deeper before you add more. Okay, so on the first one, they can make fire, but how much and to what degree can a character control it? I mean, you can't really weigh fire. Sometimes it's hard to communicate all of this, the true capabilities of your characters, to the reader. Costs such as exhaustion are common in elemental magic systems, but they are prone to feeling contrived when the character has just enough energy to do what's needed because plot, or just not enough when they need to fail because plot. I think Rick Riordan, the author of the Percy Jackson series, has a pretty good grasp on how to deal with this problem. Percy Jackson can control the element of water, but Riordan writes his stories so that Percy tends to use a certain set of abilities over and over again. This repetition allows the reader to understand his capabilities, and the problem solving in the story almost always comes down to how he can use those pre-established powers, things he has done before, to solve a different problem. Consider establishing a certain set of elemental skills that your characters might have, and reusing them to create a sense of consistency helping the reader as well understanding how you solve the plot so that it doesn't feel like a wizard did it. With the second law, limitations can come in any form that you want. Maybe they can only lift their body weight, or perhaps the water elemental they bargained with for their powers can veto their abilities at any time, or fire mages can't use their powers at night. And given the magic is often used to reinforce those character dynamics, you can think about how these limits might play into those dynamics as well. What is one person limited in that another person isn't? What can one person do in the group that the other person can't? Finally, go deeper rather than add. This is related to a problem I mentioned at the start. Sometimes when people are running out of ideas, what do they do? Add a new element. Don't know how to make the magic cooler? Add a new element. Need another character? Add a new element. Fight scenes aren't cool enough. Add a new element. Yeah, no. Legend of Korra did not add new elements, but deepened the elements that it already had. In Season 3, Zaheer, an airbender, lets go of all of his earthly attachment and he gains the ability to fly. I really liked this. It was something that played into the association Air has with spirituality and flexibility. This is about going deeper into the powers they'd already established. So think about it. What are some innovative and unique associations you could have with each of those elements? And from those associations, unique powers that might come from each of them when you go deeper throughout the story. See, going deeper also helps with rule one, because it helps the readers understand the powers better, and that helps you solve things in the plot more creatively. It's just great. But of course, wouldn't be a writing video without a summary for you. Firstly, originality is more about how you use the elemental idea narratively than simply having a different elemental setup. It's common to use it as an analogue for character, so consider using the elements to explore theme, tone, and setting instead, rather than repeat common character tropes and arcs that we've seen before. Secondly, cultural elemental associations allow us to code characters and places with traits without necessarily exploring them that deeply. However, using common cultural associations can feel less original. Consider finding new associations and therefore expressions of your elements. Thirdly, elemental magic systems fit perfectly with common character dynamics like the five man band or the power trio. You can use these elements to reflect how these group dynamics work, such as giving opposite characters opposite elements. Fourthly, elemental systems are often tonally bland. Consider adding details that inform the tone and atmosphere that you want to craft. And fifthly, in creating consistency with powers, it can be helpful to establish a series of skills that your characters have and return to. Limitations are important to consistency, and they can be used to inform those character dynamics. Consider using unique associations in order to go deeper into your element before adding new powers. That is all for today, people. Remember, brand spanking new audiobook. Go get it. Links down below. You guys are awesome. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future.